Excuse it. While you're doing that, I'm just going to go and get my cup of tea. You've reminded me. Hi, Mitzi. All right, excuse me, everybody. I uh, opened the meeting and there. immediately had a coughing fit. Anyway, hello, everyone. And welcome to another uh, McNally Jackson virtual event. Uh, my name is Marty Gosser. I'm the marketing director for McNally Jackson Books and Goods for the study. And this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, you know, we're joined by uh, two important thinkers, two thinkers and writers who've long admired each other's work and uh, the occasion of Jacqueline's new book being published this week brings us together in conversation. And I think we're gonna have uh, a chance to um, uh, just witness a fantastic dialogue. Jacqueline Rose, her newest, not, her newest book is On Violence and On Violence Against Women. It's published by Farrar, Stress and Drew, went on sale this week. You can find it at our stores and on our website. Just a small, small little plug for the book there. So congratulations, Jack, Jacqueline, though, on the publication of, of your most recent book. I saw it in the store uh, this week. I forgot to bring a copy to hold up. So that was a rookie mistake on my part. But there we go. Thank you so much. All right. So um, Jacqueline Rose is one of the world's leading feminist literary and critical um, cultural critics. She's the co-director of the um, Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities, the co-founder of Independent Jewish Voices, and a fellow of the British Academy. She's a frequent contributor. You can read her in the London Review of Books, in The Guardian, among other publications. Uh, in addition to her newest book, she's uh, the celebrated author of several other books, Sexu Sexuality in the Field of Vision, The Haunting of Sylvia Plath, Women in, the in Dark Times, and Mothers. So, so today she's joined in conversation by Amia uh, um, Srivasa. I apologize, I practiced so much to pronounce your last name and then completely bungled it. So please forgive me and I will endeavor to do better next time. Anyway, Amia uh, teaches at All Souls College in Oxford. Um, she has, her writing has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Review, Review of Books, the New York Times, Harper's. I've gone on and on. I think I've also heard that she has a new book coming out this fall that hopefully she'll plug before uh, we leave today. But right now I feel like I've talked long enough. I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for the introductions, Marty. And um, thank you, Jacqueline, most of all, for um, another, another astonishing um, book. Uh, so I wanted to begin um, uh, by talking about something that I think sort of characterizes the, the book as a whole. So it's, it's this extraordinary collection of kind of internet connected essays, um, all taking up the sort of broad theme of violence and male violence across its various kind of modalities, physical violence, psychic violence, state violence, violence and race, violence and class, violence and borders. Um, and of course you take on a huge range of issues, it's kind of astonishing, right? So everything from Me Too and Weinstein and Title IX um, to the to contemporary post-apartheid South Africa, the experience of trans women and men, trauma and literary form, and of course, your abiding preoccupation with psychoanalysis. Um, so I would characterize the book as, as or sorry, I, I think one of the things that characterizes the book is what I would call a very sort of productive ambivalence. So you insist on holding together um, what might be thought of as contradictory impulses between, for example, condemning male violence and on one hand and recognizing the psychic fragility out of which that violence is born, between seeking legal redress for sexual violence and recognizing the essential ungovernability of sex, um, and between registering the ubiquity of male sexual entitlement while wanting to leave some space for individual men to distance themselves from the what I would call the patriarchal script. Um, and so one feature of this is that you, you refuse a kind of 
radical orthodox radical feminism that would see male supremacy as a as a perfect achievement of male power and in fact you want to diagnose that vision as as part of um the pathology that gives rise to to male sexual violence so i was wondering if we could begin here with your saying something about the importance for you of holding together these contradictory impulses um, or seemingly contradictory i don't think they in fact are um, and perhaps uh, elaborate on this rejection of radical feminism Gosh, right. Well, first of all, Amir, let me just thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this conversation. It's one I've wanted to have with you for a very long time, in fact, and I'm absolutely thrilled that my book comes out just a few months before your amazing book, which I've had the privilege of reading in advance, The Right to Sex, in which we tread so much similar ground, but from different positions, although I think we overlap in many ways one of which you've mentioned, which is there's an ungovernability of sexuality, that the law is inadequate to transform it. But nonetheless, it has, to, you know, violence against women has to be called out and identified. And although you take much, much further the critique of incarceration, that is in a sense where your whole book heads. Um, so I think we're, in some of these, um, you use the word ambivalence and the unconscious several times in your book. I really was looking out for it, right? <laughs> um, so I think productive ambivalence would, I like to think, link what we're both doing. Um, and But in my case, it emerges very much out of my engagement, as you say, with psychoanalysis. Because if a human subject is anything, they are the product of ambivalence and they have to live productively with ambivalence and anything else will be fraudulent. And that really does scupper certain versions of how sexual antagonism works because it simply makes them more complex and more painful in some ways and more difficult for both sexes to sustain. So you're absolutely right that um, if you take Freud's idea of the polymorphous perverse nature of infantile sexuality and its bisexuality and its objectless libidinal generosity and capaciousness and pleasure giving um, and then you watch it straight jacketed into the antinomy of sexual difference then what you're watching is a war without end i.e a, a kind of permanent tension between what the law requires the sexual law requires and the complexity of who we are in our dreams our slips of the tongue and so on and if you if you think like that then there are certain versions of masculinity and radical feminisms would be the most obvious and most powerful and most influential one, which simply fall by the wayside. They just simply don't work. Now, before we go any further on this, um, I want to make it clear that I distinguish radical feminism in the sense of uh, Catherine McKinnon and Andrew Dworkin. And to some extent, I think you put Adrian Rich in the same group in your book from Lola, Lola Olufemi for example, for whom radical feminism is activist feminism. And that's not what I'm talking about. And, and she is as critical of say trans exclusive radical feminists as we are, as by the way, is Catherine McKinnon, but she's coming from somewhere else. And she's uh, talking about radical feminism as revolutionary feminism, as activist feminism. So let's put that aside and make it clear that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the version of radical feminism, which assumes all men are, and your formula was brilliant, the perfect achievement of the masculinity which is imposed on them. Now that's immediately a contradiction in terms because it is central to feminism that the identities imposed on us are fraudulent and non-viable and too painful to sustain and a lie. They're, they're sort of, they're, they're not who we really are. In fact, we wouldn't have feminism if we didn't believe that the identities imposed on women do not exhaust the possibilities of who we are. So in a way, I'm simply saying to radical feminism, then why don't you give the same opportunity of mismatch between the identity and the reality of what we live inside our hearts, minds and bodies to men? And wouldn't that be the beginning of a slightly more creative world? Yeah, so you have this line, I think I have it written down. You say, um, 
you know, you're discussing, discussing the problems of radical feminism in, in the specific uh, sense. And you say that it does not, quote, allow to individual men the potential gap between maleness and the infinite complexity of the human mind. And then a little later you say, how can we as feminists make the, that gap the beating heart of women's fight against oppression, against the stultifying ideology of what women are meant to be, and not allow the same internal breathing space to men. And I find that totally kind of dispositive and convincing critique. But at the same time, I want to um, ask you, and, and let's take the case of, well, I'm thinking of both the case of McKinnon, specifically, but also certain kinds of contemporary gestures and mainstream um, sort of post Me Too feminism that I think take up the radical feminist mantle. So I'm thinking of women tweeting, yes, all men, right? So the insistence that all men are, are equally complicit, um, not just at a kind of structural level, not just in the sense that they're beneficiaries, but that they are all equally vectors and agents of patriarchy. Um, and, and I do think that that owes a certain kind of logic to the radical feminist tradition. And so it seems to me that one, so one way of reading that or one way of reading McKinnon's pronouncements about male sexuality as a kind of perfect um, om omnipotent um, uh, structure is as performative. Right. So I read her sometimes as trying to precisely create a form a, a possible form of, of women's subjectivity that's released from patriarchy precisely by denying it to men. So it's a kind of inversion of what men have always done to women. So men have always spoken the truth, which is to say made the truth about women. Right. Um, and and. And what McKinnon, I think, wants to do is, is resist that by, by making men the fully determined products of, of ideology, even as she knows that they're not really. And I think what she's seeing there is a kind of um, zero sum trade off between women's freedom and, and men's freedom in some sense. I think she thinks that there's this, there's this act of kind of violence that needs, as it were, to be done to men in order for women, at least in a transitional moment, to gain subjectivity. Now, I don't know what to think about that. It does resonate sometimes with things that Fanon says at, in certain moments. Um, of course, you draw out very importantly, there are other moments that people don't attend to in Fanon, which are more um, universalist and empathetic. Um, but what do you think about, I mean, as someone who thinks a lot about performance, right, and the performativity of, of, of of, of language and identity. I mean, is, is, is that a plausible way of reading the Radical Feminist Project? Or even if it is plausible, do you think it still sort of fails on its own terms? Wow, well, I've never heard that account before. So I'm really gonna have to take it in. I mean, I think it's amazing, but two things that really stand out for me, well, a number of things, but the first two things that stand out to me is that it sounds as like if you just described polit feminist political theory as an act of revenge. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds as if you're describing. Okay, we're gonna do to men, what men do to women. We're gonna call them out and set the limits of who they're allowed to be as a kind of a reflective gloss on the way women are defined by patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes me think of something you say right at the end of your book where you think, what, I think it's even on the last page, that one of the problems with feminism is that it has not acknowledged the violence of some of the solutions it proposes to the ills and violences that it's describing against women. And I really, that really brought me short because I think you were saying something which my sister Gillian Rose always said, which is that the equivocation of the ethical means that even in our struggle against violence, we are implicated in it. And I think you were saying that feminism needs to acknowledge that if it's not going to do a false purification and a false demonization, false purification of women, false demonization of men. So I really think that way disaster lies um, so, um, but, but I think it's also for me, the account of masculinity that I find so chilling. So there are a number of ways we could, we, I, I find Catherine McKinnon, just to put it very simply, I find her depressing. 
And I find it depressing because because there's no way out in a way. I mean, she acts in terms of, she's very powerful and effective and articulate and political. And so I have a lot of time for that. But if she's right about men, we should say they are the perfect embodiment of a patriarchy, maybe that we're making them perform in the way you're suggesting, then really we are stuck, which is to say there's no glimmer of openness and of transformability. And if you think, I'm thinking of two moments in the book which make such nonsense of that. And one is the little boy who Melanie Klein analyzed in the middle of World War II, who was talking all the time about Hitler daddy and pigsty mummy and describing a scene of violence in his heart whereby he was putting these two figures at war with each other. And it's a scene of domestic abuse that nobody's ever commented on. We don't know if it's real or phantasmatic, but what's clear is that his task as a little boy is to repudiate or accept the most lethal masculine identifications that are on offer. That is why he's ill. That is why he needs analysis. That is why he needs the space to say, incredible things about his freedom to think and his confusion about what sexuality is. So I feel that case is just showing us a little boy struggling with which way he's gonna jump. And of course the culture pushes him in one direction, but the unconscious says, hey, look at the price you're paying. So I feel that's a very good example of why this version doesn't work. And the other case has to be Oscar Pistorius because Oscar Pistorius was perfect. I mean, he was the Blade Runner. He was immaculate. Reva Steenkamp was perfect. She was the lioness. There were these two, and you talk about this a lot in your book, there were these two blonde, perfect, to use one of your favorite words, fuckable people, right? I mean, by the way, I've been telling, I mean, I'm worried about her new job. And her <laughs> book says fuckable so many times, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll protest for you if there's any trouble. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be out on the street. <laughs> You're gonna be fine. Um, <laughs> But they, they were absolutely perfect. But of course, in the case of Pistorius, this was a reaction to the mutilation of his body. And when his mother says to the headmaster, when Pistorius, Oscar Pistorius is about 12 years old, when the headmaster thinks, I've got to bring this up, will he be okay? And she says, what are you talking about? He's absolutely fine as he is, he's perfect. And if you're faced with disability studies, that is correct. Everybody has the body they're meant to have. Everybody is perfect. But then as some of the psychologists on the case have commented, he was mutilated at 18 months. And the fact that he's not allowed to know that adds to the, 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 the drive to an accentuated prowess, which takes the form of shooting through car roofs and going down to shooting stands and shooting melons as if they were women's heads and ends up with him shooting four times through a closed door because either it was a woman and he knew it was Reva Steenkamp or if it wasn't a woman then he was fantasizing that it was a black criminal mm -hmm. so it's either a race crime or a sex crime mm -hmm. so in both these cases you've got something very vulnerable and actually pained I'm not trying to do a bleeding heart story here what then happens what you see in the case of Pistorius is you see that transmute into a kind of willed perfection that will not be crossed and has to be in complete control of the world. And I think that's a lie for men, but I think in a time of pandemic, we know it's a lie mm. for everybody, which is leading to an increase, of course, in domestic violence, because women are not performing the function of making the world safe and protecting their men from mortality. And that's where men start to kill them. Mm. So I think, you know, we have to look for all the signs of something a bit different. And if you, I'll just say one other thing, so I'm going on a bit, but mm -hmm. the other thing that hangs behind the whole of the book is Hannah Arendt's concept of impotent bigness, mm -hmm. which is a kind of self-congratulatory, US-driven, Vietnam-destroying, lying, technological, suicidal mastery of the Western world. Right, and it is more and more destructive the more it knows that somewhere it's fraudulent and that it's destroying the world. And again, of course, she wasn't talking about climate change, yeah. but we are. 
she wasn't talking about the pandemic, but we are. These are all warnings against a certain notion of mastery, which men are expected to embody. And I think it's the expectation and the gap between the expectation and the reality which leads to the violence. I don't think it's just becoming men as in dominant men that leads to the violence. I think it's the, it's the hiatus between the two things. Mm. No, I, I mean, I think, I think that is the only plausible story one can really, the only tr tr I, truthful story one can tell about male violence. It's a, it's a, and, and especially when one moves up into the political register, right? When you're not simply thinking about individual acts, um, but you're thinking about uh, broader patterns and you're thinking about the connections between male violence and, you know, incel culture and the far right, right? I mean, all of this um, is bound up with a, a sense of, I mean, a desire for mastery and a flailing sense of the loss of mastery, political mastery, physical mastery, racial mastery, economic mastery. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that radical feminism doesn't do enough um, to, doesn't do near, anywhere near enough to explain what, um, you know, the system, whatever we want to call it, patriarchy, male supremacy, masculinity does to men, I mean, motivated presumably by a fear of exoneration, right? You said at the very beginning, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to be a bleeding heart, right? Because you're trying to explain, but not excuse. Um, and, but that of course is another ambivalent place, right? It's, it, it is difficult to, to hold, hold that um, space. So I, I, can I just say something about the Pistorius thing? Cause I don't know if I've ever said this to you. I mean, that, that, Pistorius chapter, which is a version of a piece you originally wrote in the LRB, is just one of my very favorite things you've ever written. Um, and the, sorry, this is not an intellectually interesting thing. This is just pure praise. But, you know, the way you read, because you're obviously a great reader of text, but you're also a great reader of scenes um, and images. And the way you actually read the layout of the murder scene. Um, I mean, it's just this kind of extraordinary combination of sort of Freud and Agatha Christie, right? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> and it sort of reveals um, how much one can know about, it's, it's, it's just extraordinary the kind of how much one can know about something that is fundamentally unknowable, right? A set of motivations and intentions from just, you know, the physical, you know, the, the physical display. So I love that Pistorius piece. Can, can we um, talk about, you know, the this this question about psychic complexity and the refusal um, to to allow anyone to to comfortably be just you know purely men or purely women or whatever they're they're supposed to be whatever their identification is supposed to be and how this relates to um, trans rights and trans politics. You have this absolutely wonderful chapter in which you closely read um, these various first personal narratives by trans women and men, including Juliet Jakes, Kate Bornstein, uh, Jay Prosser, Susan Stryker, and so on. And, uh, and one of the things you're reading of these various trans narratives brings out is, is the way in which the experience of, of many, perhaps even most trans women and trans men and trans people, um, don't really accord with this kind of um, stereotypical trans narrative of being trapped in the wrong body initially, and then some form of intervention, where that's, whether that's surgical or hormonal or just simply, um, you know, a, a social kind of secures uh, the, 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 a perfect alignment um, between the, the body, the self, the self-presentation, the recognition, the, the, the social understanding. Um, and so on this kind of standard uh, story, you know, transition is an end of a ambivalence. It's a restoration of what should have been, right? The right body to the right, to the right person, to the right mind. Um, and so as you, as you show, I mean, this is just not the experience for many trans people. Um, and for many trans people, transition itself doesn't offer kind of a moment of total resolution. And the idea that transition could offer such a resolution just kind of falsely implies that those of us who aren't trans, 
right? Or in virtue of not being trans, enjoy some kind of perfect integrity between our identities, our, you know, our genders, our, our you know, how we're perceived by the world and so on. Um, and, and, you know, insofar as any of us are tempted to think that we are just sort of really and simply women or men, we're, we're kind of deluded, right? We're not really taking seriously the subterranean things we don't want to totally acknowledge about ourselves. At the same time, you acknowledge, I think, absolutely correctly that this narrative of being born in the wrong body and then transition securing um, what should have always been there, right, is politically very important, or it has been in the movement for trans rights. And it has been very important for trans, many trans women and trans men to be able to say that they are really and uncomplicatedly and simply women and men. And so this makes me, and, and it's been important because precisely because the position of the trans woman or man as a kind of faker or an unreal woman or man so make, leaves them open and vulnerable to forms of violence of all kinds, state violence, physical violence, sexual violence. So this makes me think that there's a kind of tension here um, between sort of telling the truth about the human psyche on one hand and politics on the other. So this is a very general question. I mean, how much room do you think there is in our politics for telling telling the truth about the psyche? I mean, I know you would want to complicate the notion of telling the truth, but you know, telling truths um, about the psyche. I, you, there's a call in the book clearly for, a, for more psychoanalysis in our discussion of politics, but I wonder how, if you think there's a limit to that, how hopeful or pessimistic are you about Whoa. bringing that, that in? Was that was absolutely brilliant, Anya, and I'm glad this is being recorded because I want to listen to that again. Um, let me just go back a second. One of the most extraordinary things about the Oscar Pistorius trial was the moment when the defense pleaded that when Oscar Pistorius screamed, he sounded like a woman, he had a woman's voice. Because otherwise it would have been Steenkamp screaming and therefore he would have been killing her knowingly and known that she was in the toilet, whereas he insists she wasn't. In that moment, he was willing to be a woman. The Blade Runner would rather be a woman than be caught by the law for murder, which in the end he was, although Judge Masipa did not give him a murder sentence to begin with, it was appealed and he was. That for me was an incredible moment, obviously sheer manipulation but nonetheless, the fragility of the masculine identity, the willingness to discard it, the sense that there might be other opportunities opened up to define who this man was. Now, in relationship to trans, um, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I list on the page all the examples of everybody from not just Kate Bornstein, but April Ashley saying, you do not become a complete woman. You cannot lay claim to the same experiences. A lot of trans people commit suicide. This isn't a solution, right? Absolutely scandalous statements of uncertainty and psychic pain. But I think the opposition you're referring to more is the opposition between, let's say, Jay Prosser and Kate Bornstein. Because for Jay Prosser, it is A to B. As it is for Caitlyn Jenner, it's A to B, you transition, you become the other sex, even if in the case of Caitlyn Jenner, in a way that I think has been cruelly responded to, you become the other sex in its most stereotypical, rich, white, upper-class female form, right? There's a lot to be said about that. She carries her politics from the right-wing politics she had when she was a man. Um, so for those people, it is a transition and there's nothing to be said once you get to that final point, accept your desire to be recognized as the new sex that you are. Now, Jay Prosser was an example of that, but in his later writing, it's much more about the scar to the body, the damage to the body, the fragility of the identity he's acquired. Nonetheless, it's still a journey. For Kate Bornstein and Susan Stryker, it's anything but, right? It is actually a move into a plethora of potential identities and that is as much, I would say that's as much a political claim as the other one. The trouble is that in the great wide world out there, the one that is more easy to assimilate into a kind of neoliberal bourgeois version of happy heteronormativity, other people who say, I'm in the wrong body, so I'll just transition now, and then that'll be the end of the story. And it's like the cases of the children 
who are actually playing all the parts and the parents are called into school and said, could you please decide whether he's going to wear pigtails or have his hair cut or her hair cut? The children need to know, meaning, of course, the adults need to know. So I think this is, I mean, I think trans is a revelation, a revolution. I really do in terms of how we think about sexual difference and a Pandora's box, because I don't think you can go down this path without discovering what I discovered. And then you feel the gate come down because people do not want to allow the question of psychic complexity to muddy the narratives that even if defensively they've constructed against a phenomenon like trans. Well, there's no answer to your question of how you relate the psyche and the politics, right? Uh, which is to say, I'll give you another famous example, which is surrogate mothers, which I talked about a few times before, but not in this book, which is for a good while back in the day, we're talking about 20, 30 years ago, the argument was um, the right who wanted to make it illegal would say it's deeply disturbing surrogacy. And it's especially disturbing for the other children of the surrogate mother because they see their mother pregnant and then the baby disappears. And since all infants have a fantasy of killing their siblings, um, this is actually very, very damaging for the child. Okay, So it should not be allowed in law. The left responded by saying it should be allowed in law and the psychic question is irrelevant. It's a sidetrack. It's being manipulated by the right. But of course, I mean, I want to live in a world where you can say both those things. You can say, yes, it is very psychically damaging for those children. Yes, it should be permitted in law, but you have to have the space to deal with the psychic effect. So in a sense, you've gone to the heart of the whole plea of the book which is the struggle for justice, the recognition of equality and oppression in ways that you lay out so stunningly in your discussions in your book, um, but in a way that can make room for the other psychic story, because I think it's on the side of freedom. It's on the side of more expansive possibilities. It's on the side of who do you think you are, right? That for me is a really important political question. Who do you think you are? So I don't know if I've answered your question, but oh, I, one thing I did want to say, of course, is a central figure in your book is Elliot Rogers. The in, is that his name, the incel guy? He seems to me to be your crowning male in a way running through the book, although you only have one section explicitly on him. And therefore you give your own account of how, this goes back to our previous question, of how it's his thwarted entitlement that leads to the violence. It's his sense of physical and racial inadequacy that leads to the violence. So if people could accept that they're not necessarily desirable to everybody, they don't have the perfect bodies the culture tells us we should have, they're not happy in bourgeois heterosexual marriage. I mean, I just want a world in which, this is where fiction comes in, which always can come to the surface. And I think everybody would have to stop pretending. I guess that would be the politics of the psychoanalytic impulse for me. Mm. I mean, no, I mean, that's a very, um, that does seem to me the, the utopian possibility. <laughs> um, and and I, I too, I, I, I also, I mean, I'm interested and invested in a kind of a, a greater fearlessness about what sort of lies within. And I do, and the Elliot Roger case is interesting, this connection, because lots of feminists wanted to respond to that case by saying the necessary thing that kind of was the quite obvious feminist thing, which is, well, this is this is a, a cruel and gross act of gendered violence and it's unjust and it shouldn't happen. And all of those things are obviously true, but they were really, there was a kind of studied reluctance and unwillingness to talk about what might have been, what complicated thing might have been going on um, inside of him and other people like him that led to that kind of violence. And if you suggest that there's any kind of fragility or complexity that's driving it as opposed to just simple you know hatred and male power i think uh people start getting nervous but he had no power i mean he absolutely he no absolutely he he confirms hannah arendt mm. impotent bigness he took the power because he had none so we have to think the relationship between power and power yeah i think that's 
Um, very well put. I want to say one other thing about Adrian Rich because I have a question to you because you quote her quite a lot in the book and at one point you use the word brainwashing mm -hmm. and you talk about the fact that women, I mean, compulsive heterosexuality and lesbian existence has always been a very important text for me and I've taught it a few times and students, of course, some of them get really angry with it because where is the space for their desire? Mm. And they feel it's like a superego, that text, telling you what you are allowed to desire and what you are. But I've always thought there was a fatal flaw running through it and I may have got this wrong, which is that it assumes that if you say, actually, I have heterosexual desires, that just shows the extent to which you've been brainwashed by the patriarchy, right? Mm. That just, it, in fact, it confirms the false consciousness of your sexual complexion, okay? Which means that patriarchy is 100% effective. It literally takes over every bit of your body and mind. But then how come she knows that? Mm. How can she know that's true? How can she resist it if it's total? Or to put it another way, which I do with, often with my students, which is if patriarchy wasn't effective, we wouldn't need feminism. But if it was 100% effective, we wouldn't have feminism. Okay, so it seems to me that the more convincing her argument is, is that you, that you don't know that you're being taken over, that the statement you just made about heterosexual desire is false, the more her position becomes untenable. Where did she get her knowledge from? Yeah, I mean, this brings us back to the, the same issue with McKinnon. I mean, I was going to quote a line um, to you from McKinnon, which is very, I've always found very, very um, intriguing that it's, she, she describes male supremacy as metaphysically near perfect. Okay. And that near, everything oh. rests in that near because there's a chink something you know there's like a chink in the in the matrix there's a glitch in the matrix a chink in the armor there, there's something that falls short of the perfection and you have to have that you know both politically but you also need it epistemologically as you're suggesting because otherwise how would you know what is the possibility of feminist consciousness um if we really are living under a totally metaphysically perfect system. Um, and so she never tells us, I think, where that in imperfection is. And similarly, I don't think Rich does, although I think I'm less um, convinced than you are that R Rich really is wedded to the idea that it's all just a matter of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, I the way I read that paper is is just, as again, maybe I, I mean, as, as sort of asking you know, straight identified women to, to, to just reflect <laughs> on um, what has shaped and formed their desires and what are those sort of paths not taken? What were these kind of moments in their, in their personal histories where they had forms of intimacy and affinity with women um, that held certain kinds of potentiality that they didn't take up and that they kind of set aside for men. Um, and so I don't read her as necessarily saying that all heterosexual desire is just the result of something like ideological brainwashing. Um, but, you know, well, desire is always some kind of odd interplay between, you know, agency and, and uh, um, outside formation. But I think she wants to, it, it's less about, um, diagnosing the desires that we do have and more about recalling us to the desires that we forgot we had well you're turning her into judith butler i am turning her into judith you're butler. turning her into uh melancho the melancholic subject who has had to abject the other sexual possibilities that they might have gone down but of course judith butler wrote bodies that matter mm. in response to I'm overstating this, the catastrophe of the last paragraph of gender trouble, because the last paragraph of gender trouble implies because gender is a performative, we can sort of wake up the next morning and just voluntaristically change it. And I think it was partly discussions with scholars who were interested in psychoanalysis that led to the rewrite of Bodies That Matter in which you, you don't just say, hey, this is who I am because it's a performative, 
you actually, the performance is constructed on a melancholic form of grief for the paths not taken, exactly as you put it. And the abjection of that means that it's there the whole time. It's gonna trail you for the rest of your life. Doesn't mean you could just activate it. I mean, I'm so intrigued by your point about uh, the thoughtfulness you want to get women to have in relationship to who they've become and what they were. Because of course the central theme of the book is Hannah Arendt again, her concept of thoughtfulness. And I do oppose I describe violence as a crime of the deepest thoughtlessness because you can only act if you're not thinking in a certain kind of way. But we have to think, think. We have to consider how much sexuality is transformable by conscious thought. I mean, if we could just simply turn the spotlight back on our sexual histories, that would, according to psychoanalysis, shift some of the knots and stop the single narrative that's got stuck. But it can't issue an instruction to your sexual past. One, to have been lived differently. Two, to have affected you differently. Three, to have had different outcomes. It can release a potential set of other outcomes. But the moment you start saying, and we, by the way, we'd like these to be lesbian or we'd like these to be, <laughs> then it's the super ego speaking. And the super ego is a bastard, right? It's vicious, it's cruel, it's punishing. So we don't really want sexual ideas. That's the other problem with a certain feminist voice. We don't really want, uh, feminism should be the place where political identities under instruction give way to something more modulated. And therefore I would say in the longer run more lasting because it hasn't tried to just dictate who we are. Mm. So this does, this is, I'm realizing talking to you, this book is a plea Mm -hmm. Right. Um, as was the mother's book for just opening up the space for things that we can't quite get a grip on, but make the picture look so different. Mm -hmm. Whether they are core with our political utopias or whether they contradict them. Mm -hmm. I, 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 are we supposed to be turning to questions now? Otherwise, I could easily keep on going um, if no one has any. Uh, well, you, you should, if you do have questions, feel free to put them um, in the chat box, everyone, and, and I will, and I'll read them aloud as they come in. Um, and while, while people are sort of gathering their thoughts in. Um, right. I think the two of you should just keep going, though. It is fascinating and you're on a roll. Obviously, if people have something to put in the chat box, we'll, we will uh, read it to you. But uh, I, this is just captivating. So please go on. <laughs> We've got till till just before five, is that right? <laughs> uh, you have you have another fifteen minutes. If we want it. <laughs> if you want it, yes, <laughs> yeah, you can. You it's your prerogative to uh, claim uh, to pull the plug when you're ready. Okay. So, Jacqueline, one thing you know, you were talking about um, RN's call for thinking. And, and and you give this very beautiful reading of of Arendt, um, and and you emphasize the the distinction between um, the the kind of drive to know, right, so the, which is the drive of cognition, and the, the practice of thinking, right, which is which is not driven by a desire to know, but rather a kind of, I mean, I would think of it as a kind of criticality, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, an an openness to things being otherwise. Oh, people are just saying, oh, want more. Okay, excellent. Um, and, and I wonder if that distinction allows us to think about, to, to think about two different kinds of projects that often get run together when we're thinking about what we do about, you know, polit as it were, politically ugly sexual desires, or just politically ugly desires in general. So, you might think that the, the project you were just describing, the kind of uh, a certain kind of radical feminist project that wants to just kind of discipline desire, um, you know, under the, the ethical or politically correct principles. And, and that's going to be, that's just a descriptive failure because it's not going to work and it will cause all sorts of forms of pain. But can we distinguish that from um, a, a kind of thinking desire, right? A thinking about desire. Uh, which is is not about disciplining desire, but rather a different kind of a different kind of approach relation to it. This is, is one of those. Sorry, no, go on. No, please, no, no. 
<laughs> it's one of those situations where I'm going to come up with a one word answer. A different kind of thinking desire would be another word for psychoanalysis. And I'm reminded of when Jacques Lacan came to London in the late 70s and um, somebody stood up in the audience and said, could you please tell us what you think of the distinction and the opposition between nature and culture? And he said, there is no such opposition. He said, because the concept of nature you have depends on the culture that you are part of. So she was very upset. It obviously taken a huge amount of courage to stand up and ask the question. But she came back and she said, well, then what do you oppose to culture? And he said, la psychanalyse. Hmm. Let's say what he opposes to culture is psychoanalysis. Um, and I mean, psychoanalysis is a form of thoughtfulness about desire in which you are not in possession either of your thoughts or your desire, because there's something which exceeds the mastery of the knowing mind. Um, but it creates a space, a kind of pulsing space for those fragments of your desire and your history, which are most painful for you or most repudiated by you or whatever. Um, now, Arendt, one of the amazing things about Hannah Arendt is that as she goes through her life's writing, she talks more and more about, I mean, one of the key quotes of the book is when she says, but this is relatively early on, um, she describes those realms in which man cannot act and in which he therefore has a distinct tendency to destroy. Mm -hmm. Okay. As she moves later into her writing, she talks about the despotism in the Greek domestic space and in the Greek home, the tyranny of the master whose subordination of his slaves and his wife are conditional on his free participation in the marketplace. Um, but she actually says that what he cannot bear, what he has to control in order to be a political subject, is the fact that he doesn't know from where he came and he doesn't know where he will go when he dies. So suddenly there erupts in Hannah Arendt's vocabulary a whole area of uncertainty, rootlessness, mental and physical insecurity, fear of mortality, and suddenly you see the whole system fall into place, which is, is the subordination and silencing of those forms of anxiety, which produce the sexual division of labor in the Greek home, mm. which we are still the inheritors of today. So I think at this point, when she's talking about exile, homelessness, she's talking about her own life, of course, refugee status, but she's also talking about everybody as a kind of radical exile to themselves and calling for a recognition of that. And that being in touch with the insecurities of what it means to be a human subject would be utterly transformative in itself. So I'm thinking here of Judah Kristeva's point, which I've written about not in this book because it was, it's been in response to the pandemic, the femicide that people are talking about in relationship to the pandemic. And I think I may have said this already in our discussion, which is that all those forms of fragility that Aaron is talking about are in our face at the moment. We cannot pretend that we are not gonna die. We cannot pretend that the people we love might not die in the next 24 hours or whatever. If you look at what's happening in India, we're meant to be celebrating coming out of lockdown. How are we supposed to be doing that when people are burning funeral pyres on the streets of India, right? It's also to do with, I mean, what we're witnessing with Boris Johnson is we've won the election, we've got the vaccines, we're on top of it, right? Um, but if you think globally, nobody's on top of anything. I mean, it's, it's such a clear moment where the fragility of everybody is seen as so globally interconnected. So I think what Aaron's saying is, can we have a space in which we bring those things back into the center field of what we need to understand? And it would be a very different type of knowledge and it wouldn't be knowledge as mastery. It would be knowledge as vulnerability and that we, we need that. And I think we need it now. If you just read someone like Rachel Clark, the wonderful palliative care doctor who's written at least two books about all of this since this began. And she's talking about what it's like to work with dying patients and what forms of recognition are needed. Of course, she's a unique voice because most people really don't want to talk about that. So I, I'm probably a bit affected by the moment that I'm reading Simon Weil, mm. whom of course, affliction is the truth. And I'm not gonna make the Christ move that she makes, right? The conversion move, although she was never baptized, but uh, she is talking about a kind of affliction as the heart of human subjectivity. 
which people try and master and gloss over and lie about. Um, and in that, there's no difference for men and for women. Mm. There are huge racial differences in terms of equality and poverty and race. And, and look at the number of BAME people who are dying in the pandemic. But all this has come blistering up to the surface at the moment as if we're being forced to confront, sorry for this long-winded answer, the second form of knowing this that you're thinking might be more creative and I'm really just agreeing with you. I mean it's, um, Martin are you uh, jumping in to tell me to stop? I was, no I was going to, uh, I was jumping in to let you answer and say we're going to wind up after your Hi. response okay? Okay. Okay. Well, no, I want Jacqueline to have the, the last word, but I was just going to, I was going to make yeah. um, uh, the, the, the following observation. So I felt like there was this um, moment at the beginning of the pandemic where lots of us is on, on the left, particularly feminists thought and, and feminists of a particular kind of orientation who think that um, the denial and refusal of vulnerability and interdependency you know lies at the heart of a lot of our kind of political problems uh, there was a moment of hopefulness where we thought there was going to be a kind of collective and universal recognition an end in some sense to that kind of collective denial um and i feel like there was that moment initially but then so the but then the kind of brutal, as it were, first order differences, um, material differences, differences in, in access to medicine, in uh, wealth, um, in political power, um, racial asymmetries came, came to swamp that universal condition, right? So there's the universal condition of vulnerability. Um, I mean, this is a bit like Judith Butler's distinction between um, you know, precariousness and precarity, right? So there's a universal condition of vulnerability, but then we also know that at the level of actual politics, mm -hmm. some people are rendered much more vulnerable than others, mm -hmm. right? There's a reason that it's people, of, the poor people of India who are, you know, being cremated on, 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 the, on the pyres, but it's wealthy people in India are not, and wealthy people here are not. And those have, and that has a lot to do with um, non-universal contingent uh, facts about, uh, borders and class and race. So I'm no longer very hopeful that the pandemic is going to give us those realizations because in fact, I think that some people have learned the ways in which, of course, you know, everyone knows that it's probably more when they've been in a while about their own mortality. But at the same time, a lot of people have been, re been reminded of just how relatively invulnerable class position their position in a racial hierarchy, um, you know, their position in a kind of global hierarchy makes them. And I was well, wondering how, how optimistic you, you feel. I think there's everything to play for. I think it has been a revelation. I think it's been a blight and a revelation, the pandemic. And I think people are more conscious of those things and everything from climate change to inequality, to food banks, to, ment to mental and physical health, it's all up for grabs. I mean, the nurse who nurse Johnson has just resigned from the NHS because of the scandal of the 1% pay rise. He's not gonna get away with that, I don't think. And Trump was diselected, if that's a word. Right. On the other hand, we've still got Bolsonaro and Modi. And of course, that takes us really takes us back to the question of virulent masculinity in control, denying the fragility of human life. So Bolsonaro famously said, my people could bathe in excrement and come out unscathed. I mean, why the fuck would they want to bathe in excrement in the first place? It's beyond me. Um, but in terms of what you've just said, I'm not sure if this is the right note to end on, um, but I do want to say this. When you say that rich people are not dying at the same rate, um, there's just something in the news today, which I think I would like to bring to the attention of everybody here, and that is Gaza which is to say, in terms of the bombing of Gaza, the people in the richer en enclaves of the Strip are vulnerable in ways they've never been before, which is not to be lamented because they're rich people and they're being killed, but it does mean there is literally no safe place in the Gaza Strip. And I think there's a lot to be said there about power, and violence, but we don't have time to go into it. But it just feels with that, that would be a confirmation on the one hand of the universal vulnerability of everybody,
but it also has a lot to say about class and the point where you know things have got to a certain pass because the rich are dying. Um, but I would want to end on a... Stavis describes herself as an, an, a, pes a pessimist energique, right? <laughs> and I think that's a rather wonderful expression that you just keep on. You just mm. keep on saying saying the things that you think need to be said, fighting for the things you want to fight for. I think it is still a moment of opportunity. I like to think so, although things could get worse. Okay. Thank you, Jack. That was a wonderful note to end on. Um, and, and I do recommend to everyone in the audience to read Jacqueline's book. Like all of her work, it is um, you know, extraordinary and, mo and moving and enlightening in a, in a thousand million ways. Um, so thank you, Jacqueline. And thank you. On this thank you both thank so you. very much. Could you do me a favor and hold the book up one more time so everybody can see it again? Thank you. So Jacqueline, I mean, this was just engaging and fascinating. And I was honored and privileged just to, to eavesdrop our, um, uh, for the last hour. So I can't thank you enough. Best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao. Uh -oh. Right, I'm going to uh, say goodbye. I'm going to end the meeting. I will email can the Can I team. have a word with Amya now? Um, let me um, see if I can make her the host of this meeting. Um, hold on one second. Or if we just stay here when everybody else... I can just, um, I can send you my Zoom link. Yeah, why don't you do that? Because I unfortunately have another one. I need to start in about two minutes. Oh, wow. okay, I'll send you an email right okay. now. Okay, all right. All Thank right. You. I, it was, a, it so was a wonderful to meet the two of you, albeit virtually. Thank you. Thanks very much for this Great meeting. Take, yeah. care. Take care. Okay, I'll come off this and, and come in. Yeah, yeah.